you doing? Justin here. I've got a super special guest today. It is Chris Buck. Hello. Um, I'd seen Chris on a bunch of different videos and in fact I was starting to transcribe to f some of his stuff to try and figure out some of his licks that he's done. I'm like, hang on, maybe I should just see if he wants to come and hang out at the studio and he's here, which is awesome. So I get like a free private lesson. And I figured some of you guys might not know about Chris or what he's doing. There'll be links, of course, in the description to his YouTube channel and stuff. But Chris, tell us a bit about yourself. What are you doing on guitar? I know you've got a band and you're just doing a record. And yeah, stuff, yeah. So, so we've got a record coming out later in the year. Um, with... A uh, band is called Buck and Evans, which okay. sounds like a solicitor's, doesn't it? Mo Moonlighting <laughs> as a rock band in our spare time. Yeah, um, yeah um, like I said, we've got a record coming out later so who, in the year. who's Evans? Evans is Sally Ann Evans, that's the, the singing part of it. There's two okay. disgruntled non-name members. Um, it's a long, boring story. We, we started off literally <laughs> right. as a duo, hence the, yeah. the Buck and Evans el uh, element of it. Um, and it was a kind of joke, to be honest, to get us through one show, and it just snowballed um, and became a band very quickly. Um, so we've got Bob Richards on drums and Dominic Hale on bass, like I said, two disgruntled mm -hmm. non-name members. But um, got a first single out now uh, from the record called Slow Train. Um, the record's coming out probably later part of this year, September. Stylistically, so it's... It's kind of... Um, I guess blues rock is the kind of thing that gets attached to us. Rock and soul is something else which can, sounds conveniently catchy. Um, sounds like a fish shop, doesn't it? Quite, rock and soul. <laughs> quite um, guitar-y. Yeah, yeah, fairly guitar heavy, I guess, but very much, you know, song-based stuff. I guess that's always been the sort of the prerequisite for anything that we've done is mm -hmm. that, I guess the temptation is as soon as you know that the singer in a band can sing a bit or the guitar player can maybe play a little bit of guitar, you know, you kind of, the temptation is to lean on that a little bit too heavily, but, you know, all of our favourite records, all of our favourite bands, whether it's Fleetwood Mac or whether it's, you know, Tadashi Trucks mm -hmm. Band, any of the influences we have collectively or individually, it's all very much been a case of the song comes first, and if there's any kind of cool virtuoso moments then in that, then more power to it, you yeah, know. Yeah. But uh, make sure the song is first. So it's, it's an album of, of songs, you know, whether they're any bloody good or not. I don't know, I'll let you guys decide. I, but um, I, I haven't heard it yet, but I'm going <laughs> to check it out right away. When's the actual album? Um, it'll probably be out in September, I guess. September. So the first, like I said, the first single is Slow Train, and that's on all of the uh, Spotify, YouTube, yeah, yeah. iTunes, all that kind of jazz now. So. Wicked. Cool. But, uh, yeah. So that's your band. Mm. Now you've been doing. You've got a long-running YouTube channel as well. Yeah, for, for my sins. Um, it just kind of delved into the YouTube thing, to be honest. Um, much at my wife's behest, to be honest. I was sticking videos on Facebook and Instagram and all that kind of stuff, and starting to you know accrue a couple of views. And I kind of shied away from the YouTube thing. I started putting videos of myself on YouTube donkeys years ago. I must have been about sixteen, I guess, mm. and just. As a little bit of an outlet, you know, I didn't have a band. It was just me kind of jamming along with my favourite team, started sticking videos of myself on there. Then that channel got taken down for being naughty for copyright infringement or something. Mm. I can't remember what it was, but um, I just left YouTube alone for a very uh -huh. long time. And then, as I said, my wife was giving me some jip about the fact that, well, start sticking them on YouTube. And even if it's $5 a month or whatever, you mm -hmm. get a couple of quid from people actually watching the videos. Um, so I started doing that and it's turned into this thing so I do a weekly um, I'm talking to the king of guitar YouTube now about my lowly little show I do. Um, but yeah I started doing it about a year or so ago and in that time I guess of just past 20,000 subscribers so it's growing slowly but um, yeah I think all Friday Fret works which you know as the name suggests is Friday and it's about guitar and it's just you know whether it's a concept conceptual thing talking about an element of what I do or guitar or pedals or amps or mm -hmm. you know whatever so a whole range of different whole, whatever stuff. I can f find to fill 15 minutes every Friday to be honest so uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah so you know just various things doing the old Instagram thing you know as everyone is these days just keeping it keeping it taking over and trying to make a living out of this thing that's um, yeah, just avoiding a proper job is yeah, my, right. my aim, to be honest. So, <laughs> did, avoiding a proper job is definitely priority number did one. Three I months in McDonald's when I was eighteen, so I've had a very brief experience of being a proper, being a grill wizard, as they used to call me for yeah, the yeah. for the brief time I was there, and that was that was enough of that. So, yeah. I did two months working in a pub in Chiswick. That was the only time I've had like <laughs> oh, a, man. a real job. Like any kind of any kind of service based stuff like that, I've got at most respect and just sympathy for anyone who does it because I can't think of anything worse. Yeah. So, but um, anyway, Pretty that rough. digressed. And, and you're really doing really. some demo stuff as well right yeah so bits, and, bits and bobs you know working with Yamaha now for a while and just you know keep my toe in and you know you, I guess the, the prerequisite in that respect is just, you know I've got a new stuff I like you know so mm -hmm. I'm never never going to be the guy that kind of does a demo of something or talks about something because they paid me to say it or whatever you know yeah, I've got yeah. to like something and uh, that's always been at the root of it and you know genuinely very much like the Rev Stars I think uh -huh. you know so and they're nice um, people I yeah they're great people. That's, that's Yamaha a, are nice people and there's a lot of 
industry wankers around. So yeah, it's absolutely. really nice when you meet a company where the people are nice. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the I guess the temptation is to look at a company like Yamaha and think big corporation, mm-hmm. faceless, you know, kind of anonymous company, but it's very much boils down to a couple of guys, mm-hmm. you know, Mark that I deal with and all lovely people who very much love what they do and love kind of associating with players, mm-hmm. you know, like myself. So it's, um, yeah, it's You do cool. stuff with Boss as well, because Boss are also another yeah. company where the people are really nice. Yeah, absolutely. You know. Um, you know, Matt and Jay at, uh, at yeah, Boss, yeah. lovely people, and it's so the temptation is to look at these companies and think it's going to be someone in an office a mm-hmm. million miles away, but it boils down to people on the ground who, are, yeah, who yeah. love what they do. Matt especially, I've never met yeah, anyone yeah. who's so passionate about what he it's does. Awesome, you know, he's, he's a lovely guy, yeah, yeah. so... Yeah, and and so we both play grey guitars We do, well. yeah. I, I think, thought we'd bring it along and we could yeah. I've got a feeling that they were kind of... Uh, they were in the womb at the same they time. They were, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There were pictures of them together. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, no, I, I remember when I stuck my head into Tom's and just to kind of see how this was getting on. Yours uh-huh. was on the bench being sprayed and stuff. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I've kind of felt like I've watched them both develop. So. But it was kind of your fault that I ended oh, up getting one yeah, because maybe, yeah. I heard your playing on his stand at the guitar right, show when yeah, I was doing yeah. like a thing around the corner. It was like, oh, hang on, this is it kind of pricked my ears <laughs> up and I went over and played one yeah. and was like, this is possibly the nicest strap yeah. type guitar I've I've played. I that, think I need that to. Blue Emperor has sold him a lot of guitars. I imagine yeah, I sold yeah. a lot of guitars for him. It's um, that was, I think. But the, I feel like these are as nice. Yeah, oh, absolutely. That, I don't feel like he's, that that one's markedly I th- better. I think than, he's hit a level of consistency, yeah. isn't he? Which is great, yeah. you know, because you know that was essentially what I said to him: is if you're not going to give me that guitar, make mm-hmm. me that guitar. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, so um, which I think is a. a Probably a frustrating point for him at this point, to be honest, because like I said, everyone plays that one. It's like, this is amazing. Make me this one. He was mm-hmm. like, I make other stuff as well. <laughs> Not make me that one. That exact guitar. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, he's, uh, he knows what he's doing. But so. you've got your own pickups as well, haven't you? I have, I yeah. Um, so I think you might have. I, I've, I have one. So um, same, same company, maybe. Yeah, so it's a yeah. radio shop. Um, that goes back a couple of years. They got in touch. Um, I mean, they're relatively local to me. I'm all of about 15 minutes away from them. So it kind of made sense to mm-hmm. at least start working together in some respect. And I tried some of their stuff and very much liked it. Being me, being a pernickety old bugger, I had a couple of kind of things I would change, the things mm-hmm. I wanted to try differently. And and Paul and Paul, who run Radio Shop, um, found out recently the other day. For two Pauls, it actually started as a three-man company. And you can probably guess what the other guy was called as well. No. Three Pauls. Wow. Um, it's incredible, isn't it, what the odds. But um, they just are fantastic at what they do and have a, an appreciation and understanding of pickups and what makes a pickup tick or sound good mm-hmm. beyond anything or any realm of my understanding will ever be at. Um, so they just set about kind of designing a set of pickups for me and it never it was never initially intended as being like a signature thing it was just like cool let's wind you mm-hmm. something that sounds pleasing to you so I had all these vague superlatives that you might use to describe like an Alfa Romeo or something you know, I want creamy and warm and lush and, yeah, yeah. and they're kind of frantically taking down notes thinking more is this hairy lunatic on about um, and yeah about six months later after a couple of kind of you know um, incarnations of the, the mm-hmm. initial mark pickups we, we ended up with what are now my signature pickups? And again, that was just a kind of, well, if you like them, other people might like them as well. Let's release and them as a signature thing. Is, so. is there a, a trick with them? Like they're noise-free or, or the, they're wound a particular way, like the they're th- particularly bright or midi? Or The thing that they kind of very much sort of sell as the unique selling point, I guess, is that they are reduced potting. The idea being um, they potted enough to avoid, you know, kind of microphonic feedback, mm-hmm. I guess. And that's a question I get a lot people reading that they're reduced potting is how do they stand up at high gain levels mm-hmm. and high high volume when you're on a loud stage and I've yet to have a problem with them they're great whatever mm-hmm. level stage we're at whether it's small little club stages which as you know are 10 times louder than the big stages mm-hmm. you know um, they've always been great and that's the thing they go for and their, their theory behind that is that obviously wax potting I guess is integral to stop pickups being mm-hmm. microphonic but if you cover something in wax this going to be inherent tone properties in that you know and you maybe detract from it and mm-hmm. Um, so the reduced pot in the ID, the idea um, rather is that you get an increased level of dynamics and that was the one thing I guess they noticed that I tend to play a lot with my fingers and flicking mm-hmm. back and forth between that and the pick so it's try and maximise well in, obviously in that there's going to be some inherent uh, dynamic differences and tonal qualities you know mm-hmm. so let's try and maximise that so um, yeah the reduced pot in thing but again I get a lot of a lot of questions in regard to specs and stuff, and you might as well ask the cat. It's um, I know how they sound, and I know I would like them to sound, but in regard to specifics, I'm yeah, yeah. I'm not the dude. So yeah. uh, refer you to Paul and Paul at Radio Shop to yeah. answer any specific questions I may not cool. understand yet. But um, yeah, no, they sound really good though. That's thank you very much. Yeah. They're, they're cool. I it's weird for me. I mean, obviously I like them. Like I said, I wouldn't put my name to something I didn't mm-hmm. like, but it's such a 
tonal preferences is such a specific mm -hmm. personal kind of sort of journey you go on to then get to the end of that and it looks like a fairly grandiose arrogant thing to go right oh well i assume just because i like them other people uh -huh. might like them as well so it was a little bit of a, a leap into the unknown in that respect but they've been you know kind of incredibly well received whether it's players i think mm -hmm. there's a set on every continent now and um, Qatar magazine's kind of raving over them. They had a nine out of ten review in Qatar magazine not so long ago. So yeah, it's been been a good journey so far. To be honest, at, at every point, I'm genuinely just it's cool that people like them. People, dig I think them, it's you know? worth you realizing that if you, yeah, this idea that if you like something, yeah. then probably other people will because, and it's not necessarily like just because you like them. It's because. Mm you care about your sound yeah, a lot. I think and that's... you can maybe hear stuff that people couldn't mm. name. So yeah, they can probably yeah, yeah. hear the difference, but you can hear it enough to go, guys, I, I don't like this <laughs> yeah. element. This is harsh or this bit's rough or this upper mid thing is a bit... Yeah. I, I feel like I've got cloth ears in that department. Sometimes <laughs> I just don't hear stuff. Well, that's, you know, that's but... the thing. It's You sort of you start to panic a little bit then. And I've got a decent set of years, I guess, to the extent that I know what I like and I know what I'm chasing tonally. Mm -hmm. But whether I can then define that or try and sort of express that in any sort of articulate or erudite manner is another matter entirely. So it's just trying to kind of get get the point across of what you like and what you, you want to hear, and then hoping that other people. It was a it was a scary moment for me the moment I realised that people might actually buy something based on the fact mm. that I use it on my recommendation, and that was a little bit of a oh wow okay even if it's on some small level I have some influence in mm -hmm. that respect got to be a little bit not careful about it but it's a it's a more conscious thought process than it ever was which is yeah a bit scary so i think you're on the right track of just not saying you like stuff if yeah. you don't because that's the i reckon people in the internet land can yeah. smell oh bullshit. absolutely yeah. like, people you know people are very quick very susceptible to that i think and um, I think so. yeah so it's uh, i think just if you play stuff you like then you there's no mm -hmm. there's no worries there's no recourse there's no sort of Oh, you're only playing that for the money. So. Yeah, yeah. And you play um, Victory Amps as well, right? I do, yeah. Recently, um, past sort of six months or so, I moved across to Victory. Um, shout out to Blackstar. I was with Blackstar for years. Great company, lovely guys mm -hmm. to deal with. But I think it's just, you know, it's part of the kind of, it's part of the journey, man. Mm -hmm. Kind of discovering new gear and trying new stuff and inspiring yourself with some different sounds. And the thing that instantly sold me on the Victory, the V40 in particular, was mm -hmm. the reverb. I'd always mm -hmm. wanted that kind of big natural spring reverb. And I'd been using a couple of amps, a couple of different amps parallel to the Black Star. I bought a Fuchs clean machine mm -hmm. for that kind of big, clean, high headroom thing. Um, and that had a great sounding reverb in it, but there was a couple of things. It's quite a dark sounding amp, so I was looking for something a little bit brighter than that. Mm -hmm. And the V40 just fell perfectly into that sort of thing. It's quite, and kind of fendery. It I, is, I like yeah, it very, lot, very know. kind yeah, of yeah. Um, sort of that, yeah, fendery is the word, mm -hmm. isn't it? Um, and the V140, you know, the Super Duchess recently, mm -hmm. obviously the kind of extension, the way they describe that, which is entirely spot on, is the V40 on steroids. It's that kind of just a muscle bound version of the V40, I guess. So I've been really digging that recently, but just again, lovely company to deal with. It's just great like guys, a higher so. headroom. Yeah, right. I've kind of again. It's part of the journey I'm on. I've no doubt I'll end up using not the five watt champ one day. But um, as long as it's got reverb, I'm happy to be honest. But um, I sound terrible with a reverb. But um, mm. you sound like a reverbaholic. Yeah. Well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. If I can get yeah. swimming in it, I'm uh, more power <laughs> to it. But um, yeah, the the high headroom thing is something I've kind of been digging more recently. And again, it's a journey. It'll, my taste will probably change at some should, point. Should we explain high headroom out there yeah, for somebody who some, doesn't? High headroom, I guess, the easiest way of. Uh, sort of trying to explain that is the louder it can get without naturally distorting mm -hmm. you know, the, the more you can push it without the amp starting to cave in a little bit and that for some for so many guys out there who are chasing that sort of i guess my first ever amp was a jcm 800 mm -hmm. a little oh, say little it was massive 100 watt combo 2 by 12 mm -hmm. and obviously the point of that amp is that you crank it and you get everything kind of working mm -hmm. and everything compressing and it gets that sort of marshall-esque loveliness that you get with a, a crank marshall um, so I've kind of gone from one end, one end of the spectrum to the other in that now I want the amp to be as clean as physically possible for as loud as it can get mm -hmm. without starting to cave in. And then I use dirt pedals for yeah, yeah. everything else in front of it. And I, I guess just incre it increases the dynamic range oh, for me. Absolutely. So like the, the quietest I can be and the loudest yeah, I can be is absolutely. growing. Um, and then that makes pedal choice a very sort of um, conscious thought through dis you know decisions. Mm -hmm. So... Um, yeah, I'm a bit of a pedalaholic as well, if that's even a word. But um, just gear in general. It's if anything that can distract you from practicing is mm -hmm. more than welcome. So um, <laughs> just actually becoming a better guitar player will be yeah, start right. one there. But um, I, I've got a feeling that you've put your hours in there. Well, <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> um, 
but um, yeah, so just enough. Um, you studied? Did you ever? Get, did you do any schooling like not, ACM guitar? No, uh, no, no. I kind of I had a guitar teacher at school for a while. Greg Hunt, big shout out to Greg, um, who sort of Greg's greatest asset was that I don't even mind me saying this that he didn't really care for the kind of more technical side of things. He just wanted to get kids playing and get kids inspired. And Greg never really kind of showed me the more theory kind of side of things I guess so Greg's thing was right you want to learn offspring track let's learn that offspring track I'll show you what power chords mm -hmm. are and then you go away and you you enjoy that kind of thing so I remember just voraciously kind of working my way through every Newfound Glory record every Blink 182 record every offspring record that I get hold of learning things because once you learn a power chord it's like well I've got the key now mm -hmm. to learn every song on that album you know and then trying to figure out the lead lines around that and thinking well what relevance does that lead line have to what chords mm -hmm. I'm playing so, and we were, we were talking about this off camera, my theory has vast swathing holes in it, but it's very much, I think theory in itself is kind of relative to the player that's applying it, you know, mm -hmm. it's sort of, I have my own theory, as sort of arrogant as that sounds, and it's obviously theory, but it's just bits of theory that, to me, ties mm -hmm. together these 22 frets, you know, and like I said, there's massive gaps in it, there's massive holes where someone like yourself would be able to fill them in in a heartbeat, I imagine. Mm. Um, it depends but, on what my yeah yeah theory is, you know it like I said it is, it is a personal experience mm -hmm. isn't it it's a personal sort of journey you go on and I'm getting to the point where I'm getting a little bit bored but listening to myself because the amount of playing I'm doing so I'm kind of thinking next couple of months are going to be more I'm the worst in the world for, for picking up a guitar with the best of intentions and either just sort of regressing into just mindless stuff or writing. You know, writing mm -hmm. is if I pick up a guitar or it's on, it's because I felt inspired or I've got a melody or a isn't chord progression. The point. Yeah, well, that's, know, for, that's the thing, know, isn't like, it? It's, it's a creative outlet, you know, and for a lot of people, that's not necessarily writing. That's kind of making music in other respects, mm -hmm. which arguably is a form of writing anyway. But as I said, being in a band, being the guy that kind of, you know, for 50% of the time writes the songs. Mm -hmm. Um, it's very much a case of if, if I'm picking up a guitar I'm picking it up to write something mm -hmm. or write the nucleus of a song or something that will become a song later down the line so um, I think the next couple of months um, i got to say it on your YouTube channel because it will actually make me adhere to it now is kind of um, <laughs> yeah kind of trying to learn a little bit more stuff I guess uh -huh. and not just be entirely reliant on what I know it's funny I've, I, I haven't done it yet so I'm not doing it YouTube <laughs> yet but uh, I keep threatening inside mm. to do to make a commitment to do like an hour live video practice oh, every day right, yeah, yeah. to like force myself to do at least an hour of practice yeah. and I was thinking like rather than just an hour of practice I should make it specific so I keep thinking I'm going to do like an hour a day for the next six months of like trying to play like yeah. Joe Pass or yeah, some yeah, sort yeah, of yeah, like yeah. something that I, is really challenging and then just let the internet watch me fumble around like an, an idiot for, if, if you've got I'm not of, sure if you've got no. the diligence and the sort of um kind of stay in power to do something like that i imagine it would just improve everyone yeah. exponentially you know mm. it's but it's actually doing it but yeah exactly it, you know? i get too busy or like my kid will get sick and then you know <laughs> there'll be an infinite number of excuses oh, i've got no find, just, laziness you know? is my only excuse so uh, <laughs> yeah laziness and uh, uselessness you know, I don't but, think um, that you're either <laughs> but, um now uh what i would like to do mm. now in the next video cool. so like, we'll tail this one off unless there's anything <laughs> exceptionally interesting that you'd like to share with I don't think I've ever internet. said anything exceptionally interesting in my life to be honest so it would be uncanny oh if the first time was on YouTube yeah. so um. no, self effacing is really nice <laughs> but you know um, uh, one of the things that I wanted to well why I ask you over other than mm. just to say hello and go for a beer or whatever was you've got these really nice embellishments going on that I think cool. I can't be the only one who's going yeah, that yeah. sounds really awesome so stay tuned on the channel and you'll find another video of me asking Chris how the hell he does that <laughs> please show me how to do it and then I'll try and share it with you at the same time so uh, awesome. hopefully I'll see you for that more very soon check out the links to Chris's YouTube channel and website and all of that sort of stuff which will be in the description and some extra links if you click the link over to the website where I'll put some more examples of stuff and links to less than a bit say bye bye to the internet Chris cheers guys see ya <laughs>